to carve out some time to take a look at the third and final kind of scraping, that is negative rake scraping. So what exactly is a negative rake scraping and what is a negative rake scraper? Well, unlike a uh, traditional scraper that uh, has a single bevel, in other words, the burr is formed on the intersection of the bevel and the top of the tool, uh, a negative rake scraper has a bevel on both sides, okay, it has an included angle. So the burr is at the edge out here and we have a bevel on the top and a bevel on the bottom. And negative rake refers to the fact uh, that you have this bevel on the top because it's going downhill, that's considered negative. Now as far as using a negative rake scraper, you use it the same way you would use a traditional scraper to do conventional scraping, that is flat on the tool rest. Uh, so uh, if we're using this tool exactly the same way uh, as we use a traditional scraper to do conventional scraping, then what's the difference? Why, why do we care about that negative rake? Well, to summarize, uh, it turns out with a negative rake scraper, it's really hard uh, to get into too much trouble. In fact, you can even uh, negative rake scrape directly into end grain and face work and not worry about getting a catch. Um, the big downside is this burr that leaves a pretty nice finish is also very fragile. So you will have to make more trips to the grinder to keep the burr in good condition. Uh, but as we'll see in a little bit, there's also several things we can do to try to prolong the life uh, of that burr. So it makes it worth uh, picking up the negative rake scraper to take advantage of its upsides. As far as what makes it so hard to get in trouble with negative rake, negative rake scrapers are concerned, it, it essentially it comes down to all the things that we had to worry so much about when doing conventional scraping, we don't have to worry about so much with negative rake scraping. For instance, uh, if you recall from conventional scraping, we always had to have the angle formed by the work and the top of the tool to be less than 90 degrees. And so it's very easy if you drop the tool just a little bit, it's very easy to start getting into a little bit of trouble and possibly getting a catch. Now with negative rake scrapers, uh, the same is true. I still have to have less than 90 degrees between the work and the top of the surface that constitutes the, the, the burr. But in this case, it's the top bevel. And so in order to start getting into trouble, I have to drop the tool handle quite a bit. I have, to, in the case of this particular scraper, I have to drop it at least 30 degrees before I start getting into trouble. So with a negative rake, rake scraper, as long as I have the tool handle somewhere around horizontal, a little bit more, a little bit less, doesn't matter. And as long as I'm somewhere near center line, I'm going to be good as far as that having the, uh, the angle less than 90 degrees, that is the angle formed by the work and the top of the bevel. Now with a negative rake scraper, uh, for some reason there's very little energy transferred to the tool. Um, I'm not exactly certain why, I think it has something to do with the, the negative rake on the top. Uh, the direction of the energy being transferred simply doesn't come down on the tool. Uh, it may also have to do with the fragile burr that um, if even if you try to get a cast by pushing this in really hard, you'll destroy the burr and dull the tool before you'll get a chance to get uh, a nasty catch. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, there's very little energy transferred to the tool and, and that means it's perfectly safe uh, to use a negative rake scraper directly into end grain even on face work. Um, this is the one exception uh, where you're using a wide cutting angle uh, directly into end grain on face work that's acceptable simply because the tool uh, doesn't absorb enough energy to cause you any problems and we can s see that There's no energy, there's no uh, sense, even if I push this pretty hard, the tool is completely neutral, there's no catching trying to push down the tool at all. And that's a really good thing because so far we, we only have, uh, we have shear scraping we can do on end grain, um, uh, but now we have also negative rake scraping that we can use on end grain and face work. Now the second thing that we had to do with conventional scrapers uh, due to the fact that it has all that force trying to leverage the tool is that we didn't want to engage too much of the cutting edge, too much of the burr at one time. Uh, usually maybe an end grain about a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch. Uh, and side grain you could probably go as much as engaging about half an inch of the tool. But never, never engage the whole edge. That would be just asking to get a leverage catch. Now, with uh, negative rake scrapers, because there's no energy, very little energy being absorbed, 
uh, we can pretty much engage the whole edge at once. Now the fact that you can engage the whole burr at, a, at all at once on a negative scraper, I find to be uh, the most valuable part of negative scrapers because that makes them very good for refining shape. Uh, you can imagine even right here, I have a straight edge negative scraper uh, and it's very easy for me to refine this surface uh, and even use that edge as a reference uh, to make a nice straight surface. Uh, same thing with a curve. If I have a, a curved negative rig scraper and I'm looking for something about that curve, I can engage that whole ne scraper edge at one time and it's much easier to get out those peaks and valleys. So as you can see, there's a pretty big, couple of pretty big upsides uh, with negative rig scrapers. Uh, one, they're really good for beginners especially because uh, really hard to get into too much trouble with these. Uh, they leave a really clean finish and um, we can even use them directly into end grain. Um, and they're also really, really good for doing final shaping. Uh, but now we have to deal with that big downside, which is the fact that the burr on a negative rig scraper is very fragile. And so we're going to have to take more trips uh, to the grinder than we will with a traditional scraper if we were doing conventional or shear scraping. But there are several things you can do to try to prolong um, the life of the burr uh, on a negative scraper. Now the first thing you do uh, is that unlike cutting, uh, you know, when we're using the bowl gouge to cut the outside of this, speed helps. Speed gives you a cleaner uh, cut and it's easier to cut. But it doesn't really help you as much with scraping. Um, and in fact, the extra heat, all that heat that's gonna be built up from the friction uh, especially with the fine burr, the, the fragile burr on a negative scraper, it's just going to ruin the, the edge that much quicker. Um, so sometimes even with a bowl this high, this is only about four or five inches, I'll even scrape as slow as 500, 400 RPM. Um, and you'll still get just all the same benefit uh, as if you were going faster, but your burr will last a lot longer. Now, the other thing you can do is as you're scraping with a negative rake scraper, uh, it's to try not to stay on one part of the burr uh, too much. Try to spread the work out as you work. Uh, that was kind of true with conventional scrapers, but we didn't have to worry so much about, uh, you know, I could use this part of the cut of the burr for a while and then move this for a while. With a negative rake scraper, you kind of want to keep it moving around. That'll also reduce the heat and make that burr last a little bit longer. And there's a couple, a few ways I like to go about doing that. Uh, one is if I have a curve like this, uh, I can more or less keep the tool in the same attitude, the same position. And as I go around the curve, the part of the cutting tool, the part of the burr I use, uh, automatically transfers to the other side of the tool. And so I'm using the, I'm managing to spread the work across uh, the whole burr. Uh, another way I'll sometimes do, if I have, let's say, I have a little bit of an undulation. I'll have a little bit of a, of a peak right between those two spots. Um, what I'll do is uh, I'll start with the center of the peak and just sort of rock the tool back and forth. Just to get rid of that peak. And uh, I'll finally a third way to do it, uh, and, I'll, and actually this can even improve the surface a little bit, is let's say I'm trying to get rid of a little blemish right about there. Uh, you can simply run the tool back and forth. And that'll even improve the finish even more. Uh, you can see this could probably be sanded right now with, I would probably start with 220 with that. And finally, a third thing you can do uh, in addition to slowing down the, the speed and trying to spread the work across the, uh, the burr is to make sure you don't put too much pressure. You want to have almost no pressure pushing against the work. Uh, you may have heard the expression, let the wood come to the tool. Uh, nowhere have I find that to be more true uh, than with negative rake scraping. If I try to push this tool in too hard, it's going to ruin the burr pretty quickly. Uh, in fact, you only really need to just barely touch the tool to the work and with a little bit of down pressure and it works just fine that way. I'm not putting any extra pressure uh, pushing into the work right now. Uh, I'm just barely letting the, uh, the burr touch the surface 
and it's doing its job just fine. Now as far as preparing a negative brake scraper, uh, it's very similar to a traditional scraper except that I have to grind on both sides because I have two bevels. Now whichever bevel you ground last, in other words the one on the bottom, uh, that also faces down uh, when you go to use the tool. So in other words, if I have the tool in this position uh, doing my last pass in the grinder, then I use the tool in that same position. Um, now what's kind of nice about that is that if I have uh, uh, if I have a, um, a negative race scraper like this one, which is a skew scraper, uh, if I finish up on this side, uh, I can go ahead and use a tool and maybe work on the left hand sides of some beads and then I can come back and flip the tool over, touch up the other side, and now I can work on, say, the right-hand side of some beads that I'm trying to clean up. In other words, you don't need two tools like you do with a traditional scraper. It's just a matter of which side I ground uh, uh, and turned up the burr on last. Now, a lot of turners, they'll just uh, grind this, a single bevel uh, and use it that way, and there's nothing wrong with doing that, but I'm fine, I find that I like, just like I do with my traditional scrapers, uh, I like to use a secondary bevel. And so my, uh, my primary bevel, the one that's for relief, uh, I just use uh, 40 degrees um, simply because that's what I use for my skews and so it's convenient. I already, I already have a setup for that uh, bevel angle. But for the secondary bevel, uh, I'm using about a 60 degree included angle right on the tip here. And what I'll do is I have a platform uh, that's set at 40 degrees and I have a little spacer here with some magnetic on the back side that I put on and that gives me about 30 degrees on each bevel or 60 degrees included. Now when you do the secondary bevel on the very edge uh, you don't want to really lay into it like you do when you're doing the primary bevel. Um, it takes very little uh, to, to, to turn up a burr in this case. Very light touch like that is all it takes to get a nice burr turned up on this side. And what I'll do is I'll continue to use, I won't regrind the primary that often, only when my secondary bevel starts to get a little bit large, uh, then I'll go over and I'll take off some more material uh, on the primary bevel uh, to make, so that my secondary bevel is not so big. Now usually at this point, uh, I go through the different grain orientations to see how the tool works uh, in various uh, side grain and end grain. But it turns out that uh, negative right scrapers, they may not be the best at any particular grain orientation, but they work pretty good everywhere. Uh, so I thought instead what I would do, what I, would, I would show, go through some of my uh, favorite places to use a negative right scrapers. And the first is to clean up the shape on the outside of a bowl. Now, um, ideally, uh, you'd be able to take a gouge and make one pass here because uh, it leaves such a nice finish uh, and be able to start standing but um, for mere mortals uh, it usually doesn't work out that way. You usually end up with some some uh, bumps and valleys and grooves that you want to uh, get rid of and perhaps even some difficult grain that might be tearing out. And so the first thing I always try is a negative escaper because uh, in addition to, to doing a pretty good job, I don't have to worry about whether I'm cutting end grain or side grain or whatever. So uh, I can see where the gouge came out, there's a little bump right there. So I can go ahead and start use really low speed and see if I can get rid of those little bumps. A little trick I learned um, for getting rid of bumps, a lot of times you will start not to be able to see them, but your fingers are very good at feeling them. I can feel there's a bump, uh, there's a little high spot right there. Now what I used to do is I used to mark the high spot, but recently I was at a demo, a Glenn Lucas demo, and he pointed out the problem with that is as soon as I touch the scraper that the line disappears. So what he suggested doing is actually uh, marking either side and I found that works much better. So I have a little bit of high spot right there. Normally I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had this middle line to begin with. But, um, and that seems to work. So a lot of what happening, a lot of, a lot of what I'm doing now at this point is just taking the time 
to keep refining the shape. I don't want to have to go to sandpaper uh, because sandpaper, uh, because I have mixed grain, if I sand too much on a, on a, on a high, on a coarse grit, I'm going to end up uh, distorting the bowl. So I'd much rather get the, sh the shape spot on with tools. Um, besides, it's much more fun to work with tools than it is to uh, have to sand. And I'll just keep at this uh, until I'm satisfied with the shape, both visually and, as, and when I can no longer feel any uh, valleys and peaks. And another thing I often employ, uh, I got these on Amazon. These are called uh, ship curves. I'm not sure what they're really is for. I'm, I guess they're for dining, designing ships or something. Um, it's they. A lot of times you can put these up against the curve, and you can find little that. I can see there's a little valley right there. Probably just take a little bit off the rim for that one. Now that's looking pretty good. Now I could go over it with uh, a shear scraper, um, but a lot of times the negative scraper, uh, although it won't be quite as good as the, the shear scraper, is often adequate enough to start sanding. Another place uh, I like to use negative scrapers, um, largely because they're low risk, uh, is doing detail work, especially if you have, uh, I have a lots of little small uh, mini uh, negative egg scrapers, um, I, mainly because a lot of times you're doing detail, you're getting close to the end of, of, a, of, a, of a piece of work, um, and uh, you know you don't want to start sticking things into your work uh, that could end up having a patch. So I find um, negative egg scrapers can uh, be a quick way to add some detail to something uh, without too much risk of destroying the piece. The famous one more cut. And just as I like to use uh, negative egg scrapers on the outside of the bowl, uh, I also like to use them on the inside of the bowl. Now, conventional scraper will do pretty good near the bottom of the bowl uh, as far as shaping and giving a nice finish. But as soon as that conventional scraper uh, starts to get into the fibers uh, at about 45 degrees, uh, I don't like to take that risk anymore because now I'm starting to get into end grain and I'm already going to get a catch with the, with the, uh, with the traditional scraper. And so, uh, very much like I did uh, with the, uh, the outside of the bowl, uh, I'm just going to try to refine uh, the shape. And I don't have to worry about how much of the, as we, as we uh, pointed on before, I don't have to worry about how much of the edge I get in contact. And I can even come all the way out to the rim uh, because there's no, there's no pressure on the edge of the tool. There's a little bit of vibration. And you can deal with that by keeping it slow and using your hand to support the work. Now, I would never do this with a conventional scraper. You're almost asking to have a patch. Now 
And just like I did on the outside of the bowl, I'll look for little bumps. I have a little bit of a, I have a little bit of a ridge right there. So I'll mark either side of that. The inside of the bowl is a little bit harder because you can't really see. With the outside of the bowl, you can view on the far side and you can actually see the undulations until they start getting really, really small. Uh, but with the inside of the bowl, you don't have that advantage. But it's still more of the same. It's just finding those valleys, finding those peaks. And keep tweaking them with the negative direct scraper until you're satisfied with the way it feels and looks. This is looking pretty close. A little bit of a bump right there. Maybe not, because sometimes you, it's good to try a different spot. If you think you feel a bump and you're not sure, it's always good to try a different part uh, of the bowl because sometimes the grain will feel, uh, give you the sensation of having a little bump. Just a hair right there. And that's feeling really nice. Now we don't want to leave out spindle turning. Uh, so what I tend to use um, negative rig scrapers for and spindle turning uh, is a lot of times if you just can't quite get a cove or a bead correctly, um, negative rig scraper uh, is safe and does a pretty good job. Now if I try to use um, negative rig scraping directly into side grain, it does an okay job. Uh, it's not as good as um, shear scraping, but not as bad as conventional scraping. It doesn't tend to get underneath the fibers the way conventional scraping does. And it'll leave you with a perfectly sandable surface. Uh, so it's ideal for doing things like uh, beads and coves, which are a mixture of uh, side grain and end grain. And so for instance, this bead, I uh, couldn't quite get it right on the right hand side. I'd come in with a negative right scraper and refine that shape. And if I need to do the other side, I can either have another tool or I could just go to the grinder, which I'll do, and just turn up the burr on the other side real quick. Uh, as we, we saw, now as we saw with um, shear scraping, you can also use shear scraping to do this. But sometimes, uh, when you have small beads and coves, it's hard to get a shear scraper in there without catching the uh, upper side. So I tend to, even though the the, uh, the shear scraper will do a better job, do a better finish, uh, I find negative rig scraping to be a little bit less risky. I could probably keep going on for quite a while uh, with examples, but we'll do just one more. Uh, in this case, a hollowing end grain. Um, let's say that you know, we've gotten past the point uh, where we can use um, cutting tools, and now we're hollowing with a conventional scraper. And we finally get to pretty close to our final depth. Um, there's a little bit of a problem um, because <clears throat> just as we have side grain on the outside of this, uh, we also have side grain on the inside and that conventional scraper may not do a really great job. Uh, as well, there's a little bit of tear out. Sometimes uh, the, negative, the, the conventional scraper can be a little bit aggressive when you're hollowing and make a little bit of a tear out right there. And so we can improve this uh, both the side grain on the inside is a little bit rough and this tear out with a negative rig scraper and of course being a negative rig scraper I'll slow down the speed a little bit and I'm not worried at all once again I'm not worried about how much of the burr I'm engaging at once I 
In fact, in this case, the more I can engage more of the burr, the easier it is to get a nice smooth surface. That's feeling nice and that's feeling <clears throat> like a nice curve. And it looks like we're getting rid of a little bit more work to go because that was pretty deep tear out. And that's looking much better. Probably needs a little bit more work. All right, that's my bit on negative ray scraping. And so we've covered all three kinds of scraping at this point. Uh, conventional scraping, shear scraping, and negative, negative ray scraping. Uh, so the big question now is, which one is best? Uh, well, I happen to be of the opinion that why settle for just one? Uh, put all three to use. They all have their strengths and their weaknesses. And there is some overlap as well. Now, in addition to having finished a little series on scraping, I feel like we've also reached the end of all the fundamentals. Uh, we've covered pretty much everything I know about the basics, the nitty gritties of wood turning. Um, but now that we have this, uh, this foundation, it's hardly the end. It's really just the beginning because now we can start looking at uh, putting different techniques together to do things like, say, hollow bowl or uh, how to make a goblet. As well, we might be able to start looking at more advanced topics uh, like maybe a multi-part multi series on multi-axis turning or uh, perhaps uh, on how to do wing bolts. So until next time, get out in the shop and try to do some negative rig scraping and see uh, what it can do for you, how it fits into the kind of work you're doing. <laughs>